While some relics are the obvious things you would expect, nails said to be from the crucifixion, bits of the true cross, Jesus' burial shroud, many of them are weirder, grosser, or otherwise more fascinating than you might have guessed. Despite being one of the few saints who have a feast day known to non-Catholics, practically nothing is known about St. Valentine. In fact, there are three St. Valentines, any of whom might be the guy whose decapitation we celebrate with romantic dinners every February 14th. Several legends have been created to justify his association with romantic love. However, we probably devote that day to love because it's the day Geoffrey Chaucer thought birdies did the dirty, as told in his poem The Parliament of Fowls. Only adding to the confusion is the fact that there are no fewer than 10 places that claim to be the home of the relics of St. Valentine. Of these relics, one of the most interesting has to be the flowered wreath skull found in Rome's Basilica de Santa Maria in Cosmedine. In case there's any doubt about whose head you're looking at, his name is helpfully written across his forehead. As an added bonus, the same church is also home to the famous Mouth of Truth. It is said that it will bite your hand off if you tell a lie. While Catholicism definitely has the most in the way of relics, it doesn't have a monopoly on the concept. It required the spear of Longinus to pierce the side of Christ. He who holds it becomes invincible. Hitler's power increases tenfold. There are several relics said to be the mortal remains of Siddhartha Gautama, the spiritual leader better known as the Buddha. These relics include a hair that's supposed to have been Buddha's that moves on its own. There are also the 10,000 colored crystals said to have been sifted out of his cremated remains. But perhaps the most popular relic of Buddha is his tooth. Many different sites claim to have the only authentic example of it. This is probably because it's supposed to be the only thing that remained after his cremation, not counting the thousands of crystals, apparently. One such tooth, located in Rosemead, California, is inhumanly large and reportedly continues to grow even today, long after Buddha's death. It also apparently radiates light, emits a beautiful fragrance, and attracts baby birds. Another relic claiming to be Buddha's left canine can be found in the Temple of the Tooth in Sri Lanka. The person who holds this tooth is said to have the divine right of rulership. Naturally, wars have been fought over it. Singapore likewise claims to have the real tooth at its Buddha Tooth Relic Temple and Museum, a beautiful and elaborate tourist destination in Chinatown. St. Camillus de Laus was a 16th century priest and nurse from Italy whose compassion for the sick caused a revolution in how we think about healthcare. He was known as the Giant of Charity, and the concept that the rights of the weak are not weak rights is attributed to him. He founded a religious order called the Order of the Ministers of the Sick, also known as the Chameleons. This group has continued to carry on his work in the ensuing centuries. Camellius' advice to his adherents was to put more hearts in those hands when serving the ill. How do we preserve the empathy and compassion found in a heart like Camellius? Well, in this case, you actually preserve the heart. The physical heart of St. Camellius was preserved in a box with herbs. The infirmary in Rome, where Camellius died, was transformed into a highly ornate Baroque chapel where the heart is on permanent display. It rests inside a glass casket surrounded by Doric columns and elaborately carved angels. From there, it serves as an inspiration to pilgrims to tend to the poor and infirm. St. Anthony of Padua is venerated as the patron saint of lost things. Perhaps ironically, following his death at age 35 in 1231, one thing that he lost was the majority of his body to the natural process of decomposition, which is something that doesn't always happen to saints. One thing that remained, however, was his lower jaw, tongue, and vocal cords. When the body parts were exhumed to move them to a new basilica 30 years later, they were found to be completely preserved. This miracle was interpreted to be representative of his oratorical skill in life. You can go see the remains of Anthony's oral apparatus in Padua even today. The jawbone is kept inside a fancy head-shaped fishbowl display. Just below the jaw is a golden reliquary in which the tongue is housed. Below the tongue is a more modern reliquary holding the saint's vocal cords. Perhaps the most famous relic among modern audiences is the Shroud of Turin. It's a linen cloth marked with a negative image of a man on it. Many claim that it's the burial cloth of Jesus whose holy presence rubbed off on the shroud. The shroud, however, isn't the only bit of cloth with Jesus' face printed on it. It is preceded by a relic known as the Mandilion, a strange-looking word that just means towel. The Mandilion, also known as the image of Edessa, is considered the first icon, that is, a sacred image for religious devotion. It is also one of the most notable miraculous artifacts not made by human hands. The legend of the Mandilion say that Abgar, the king of Edessa, wrote a letter to Jesus asking him to heal him of leprosy. Jesus wrote back saying that while he could not be there, he would send a disciple in his stead. 
A disciple brought with him a washcloth on which Jesus had dried his face, leaving his holy visage indelibly printed on the cloth. The man de Leon healed Avgar, but unfortunately the holy face was lost when crusaders sacked Constantinople in the 13th century. Nevertheless, the Orthodox Church still commemorates this important relic every August 16th. Technically, there shouldn't be relics of Muhammad, the great prophet of Islam, not because he wouldn't have body parts or clothes to leave behind, but because venerating relics could easily be interpreted as idolatry by more strict-minded sects of Islam. Islam has a general prohibition against the depiction of sentient beings and art for this very reason. Setting up a shrine celebrating parts of Muhammad would be much worse. That said, there are relics of Muhammad. The veneration of relics in Islam predates the condemnation of them, so those who chose to seek them out are taking part in a longer tradition. The relics of the Prophet, believed to be the most authentic, are kept in a special wing of the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul. The palace contains such notable objects as Muhammad's battle standard, his swords, one of the teeth he lost in battle, and his sandals, which are a traditional source of blessing. However, one of the more unusual relics to be found is a glass reliquary that houses Muhammad's beard. The story goes that the beard was shaved from the Prophet posthumously by his favorite barber Salman the Persian in the presence of witnesses who testified to the hair's authenticity. Almost nothing is known about the life of St. Janarius, except that he was a bishop in Italy who was martyred. This possibly occurred during the persecution of the Emperor Diocletian in the early days of the 4th century. What is known is the popular ritual carried out multiple times a year in Naples. During this ritual, John Warius' 1,700-year-old blood turns liquid and starts to bubble when brought close to his skull. The saint's dried and congealed blood is kept inside two glass vials inside his silver willequery. At three points in the year, including the saint's feast day, a silver head said to contain the skull of John Warius is placed on an altar. Then the vials of blood are brought out of the bank vaults where they're kept the rest of the year. When the vial is brought near the skull, the previously solid blood turns liquid. Usually this happens instantly, but sometimes it takes days. When a liquid state is achieved, the event is celebrated with a 21-gun salute while crowds of people kiss the miracle blood jar. Instances where the blood fails to liquefy are thought to herald great catastrophe. Examples of these moments are the beginning of World War II in 1939, a disastrous earthquake in 1980, and one particular election in 2016. St. Catherine of Siena began seeing visions of Jesus at age 7. By the time she was a teen, she'd pledged herself to perpetual virginity. She cut off her hair and entered a nunnery to avoid potential suitors. Soon after, she had a vision of Jesus visiting her and giving her a wedding band as a sign of his love. This wedding band, however, was no simple ring of gold. Catherine's ring was made of the holy prepuce, you know, the baby Jesus' excised downstairs skin. Catherine claimed for the rest of her life that she could see this ring on her finger, though it remained invisible to everyone else. Later, she received the stigmata when a crucifix shot lasers at her. Such an interesting woman deserves a remarkable relic, and indeed, she got one. If you ever wanted to see St. Catherine's head in a fancy box, you are in luck. After Catherine's death, her head was smuggled back to the saint's hometown. It made the journey in a paper bag via a miracle in which the severed head turned into rose petals when guards looked inside. It's now available for pilgrims to visit at St. Dominica's Basilica in Siena, Italy. Also included is a smaller reliquary containing her right thumb placed nearby. St. Clare of Assisi was a protege of the famous Francis of Assisi, but she was an accomplished saint in her own right. Born to a noble family in the late 12th century, Clare spurned earthly wealth to join her friend Francis in a life of pious poverty. As a symbol of her renouncing worldly concerns, Francis cut off Clare's legendarily beautiful hair and dressed her in rough sackcloth. Soon, Clare found a religious order, the Poor Clares, which is still active today. And she performed such miracles as driving off a whole army of Sarusians using nothing more than a communion wafer. In 1958, she was named the patron saint of television because of a miracle in which she was granted a vision of Christmas Mass from miles away while bedridden with illness. The Basilica of St. Clair and Assisi contains several relics. These include a crucifix that once talked to Francis and a crypt with Clare's entire body preserved in wax. Near the tomb is a display of other relics, including a box of Clare's hair that Francis cut off and a shirt she made. There's also a crystalline flax filled with Clare's fingernail clippings. Relics of the Virgin Mary are rare, but in the Middle Ages, one relic of the Blessed Virgin was surprisingly common, her breast milk. Containers claiming to contain the fluid that nursed the Son of God were so common that reformer John Calvin said in a treatise about relics that even if Mary had been a cow her whole life, she could not have produced such a quantity. One notable miracle involving the Holy Mother's milk was known as the Lactation of St. Bernard, in which a vision of Mary appeared to a 12th-century monk, Bernard of Clairvoy, and shot a stream of milk into his mouth. 
which either granted him wisdom or cured an eye infection. A miracle more accessible to the public can be attained at the Shrine of the Milk Grotto just outside Bethlehem. Legend has it that Mary spilled a drop while nursing, which turned the stone there white, and now hopeful mothers mix bits of soft, chalky walls of the grotto with their food, hoping it will help them conceive. This milk powder is available to visitors of the chapel, and the shrine bears countless letters and baby pictures from former pilgrims attesting to the efficacy of Mary's milk as a fertility aid. Generally speaking, relics are objects. They're bones or blood or scraps of cloth or bits of wood things you could theoretically hold in your hand, though not without a great deal of controversy. It's not often that a relic is the absence of a thing, and yet one of the most common pieces of evidence that Muhammad walked the earth is the presence of something intangible, footprints. Some Muslims believe that whenever Muhammad stepped on a rock, he left behind an indelible footprint. As such, there is no shortage of shrines dedicated to these foot-shaped imprints throughout the world. For example, Topkapi Palace in Istanbul has one. And they can also be found at the Shrine of the Holy Footprint in Delhi, India, and at the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, among many other places. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about religious history are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.